Okay. Thank you, Jamie. Um, okay, so my name is Jordan Williams. I'm one of the co-founders here at Springboard VR, and um, these are open huddles. I'm glad you're, you've been able to join us. If you do have Q questions during the uh, the open huddle, please go to here in, in the, the, the big marker. There's a little tab called Q&A. Click in the Q&A and, and write your question down in there. And that way we make sure we'll, we won't miss it. You can upvote questions if you want to, to make them more readable or whatever. Um, at the end of this open huddle, I'm going to be introducing Spencer Barber, who is uh, one of the owners at Virtual Experience in Provo, Utah. He has been operating his VR arcade for about a year and a half um, and has had a lot of success doing it. Um, and so feel free to ask him uh, any question that you want. And um, yeah, so uh, actually give me about 30 seconds and uh, we will get going. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start us out. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, pop them into the Q&A part of Big Marker. And uh, the Q&A is visible for me. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, Herman. Uh, once we get to the Q&A section at the very end, if you have a question, just we'll, we'll get to you. Um, so, and we will also, this the, the PDF that I'll be showing here in this open huddle, we will be sharing that with everyone after, after um, it's over. So everyone will have access to this document once we're over. So anyway, I will just uh, very briefly kind of, here's our agenda today. Just gonna give a quick overview of what Springboard VR is and what it does for your location. We're gonna be going into best practices for VR arcades this week. We're gonna be going over sales and marketing. I'm going to be going over one of the content offerings and what you should look for in what content to offer your um, your patrons. Stuff like Skyrim VR, even though it's popular, actually may not be very good for your location. I'm um, going to give you a little bit of information on the Beat Saber tournament that's happening here in a couple of days, which uh, we're still taking applicants for that. Going, going to go over one feature, specifically in the Springboard VR a feature set. that going to go into a little bit of detail there. And then I'll be introducing our special guests and you'll have opportunity to ask him any question. So I'll get into it. Uh, so very quickly, if you're not familiar with Springboard VR or arcade management software, um, what it is basically, it, it's kind of four main components. If, if you are an operator, you know how difficult it is to get your customers in and out of different content and, and really allow them to manage their own experience by themselves. And we basically created a very, very user-friendly interface for your customers to pick and choose content. It's very like very much like Netflix, so it's something they're sort of used to. It's in VR, so it's immersive. Um, it's a nice little environment. And so it allows them to kind of filter content, you know, say, hey, I only want to play easy content or I only want to play shooters. Uh, they'll be able to kind of customize their experience in that way. A station management, so your ability, if you have 10 stations or 100 stations at your location, uh, you have the ability to kind of see on an iPad or iPhone or whatever, um, a high level view of all your stations. Are they in use? Which ones are not in use? How much time is left on station three? Who's coming, who's coming in uh, on station four in 30 minutes? How many people are in their party? Do I need to pause station two? Hey, station five is calling for help. Let's go over there and see uh, what's going on. Um, all sorts of uh, features like that allows you to to run your your business without having to have a, a lot of overhead. Um, I know some some operators even have a up to a one to ten uh, ratio of employees to stations uh, due to the software. And so then we also have a reservation system. It's kind of a booking widget that you can put on your public website that integrates into Springboard and uh, kind of 
puts all your bookings into into one spot so it's very easy to kind of manage that the customers can very yeah very easily say hey i'm coming in with four people and i want two hours of time or it's also within two clicks be able to manage walk-ins you can also take payment online with different pos integrations and those sorts of things and lastly commercial licensing so we have uh, around 230 titles available on our marketplace uh, we also what we're really excited about is not necessarily the quantity but the quality and also the pricing we have exclusive pricing on a handful of titles that uh, are cheaper on our platform than they are anywhere else um, you know we've done a lot of research into what makes sense in pricing for uh, vr arcades and and we're we're trying to preach the message right now which i'll get into this a little bit more in the sales and marketing section that Pricing really needs to be somewhere around the six cents per minute mark um, it's for, for arcade owners to, to really be successful. But uh, transversely, arcade operators should only actually be charging somewhere around $25 an hour. Uh, but anyway, I'll get into that more here in a second. So also at the end, if you do have any specific questions about the Springboard platform, happy to answer those as well. But that's just a very brief overview for you guys. Okay, so sales and marketing in VR, um, it, it certainly can be a challenge and, and something just right off the bat that I wanna share with you guys is even still, so the VR arcade industry has been around now for two years, maybe a little bit more than two years, some locations at least, and still 95% of people in the world have never tried VR. Um, and if you are an arcade owner, you know how difficult it is for that first time VR user to put on the headset, to pick up the controllers, to know what the heck they're doing. Um, it's safe to just assume that every customer needs a lot of handholding. And, and there's been some arcade owners who've done like uh, intro videos, like, hey, go watch this intro video before you come to the station. And those certainly have been shown to help, but they're not the end all be all solution. And, and what we've found is, you know, we, uh, we did a survey with around 150 arcade owners and very robust survey and what we found is the profitable arcades um they they budget in a, you know a specific amount of time to spend with every single customer to make sure that they really understand what they're doing before kind of sending them off and saying okay good luck have fun and so that's very very important as uh, you're considering opening or or if you are open um that 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 customer Getting customers to come back, that very first experience is so powerful. And, and as you all know, the reason why you're even interested in opening a VR arcade or maybe you already have is because you know how powerful this technology is. And yeah, the technology does speak for itself once you put on that headset, but you want to make sure you do everything in your power that your customer feels fully comfortable with what they're doing with the headset on their face. You know, are they uncomfortable that people might be looking at them because they've got this thing on their head or they don't know what they're doing or you're trying to show them what the grip button is and they're getting flustered. All these things are very, very important uh, to having a really, really good customer experience. Um, yeah, I guess side note here, too, I, I definitely want to kind of run through this. You know, we have we definitely do have a lot of data uh, and, and that's what I want to share with you here. I'm not saying that we are the industry experts, uh, but we certainly think that folks like Spencer who are going to interview here at the end is. So I'm going to run through this fairly quickly uh, and kind of let Spencer fill in any holes that we might've missed or allow you guys to ask, give you guys more opportunity to ask questions because you probably want to ask him questions and not necessarily listen to me talk. So I'll, I'll keep going though. But, Overall, you know, as, as probably a lot of you all have seen, it's very difficult to try to explain to someone what VR is. Um, you know, you tell your parents, your brothers, your cousins, your friends, you can, you can uh, be the best communicator in the world, but until they actually put on the headset, it just simply won't click for them. And, you know, there's certain tools like mixed reality that, that helps with this, but overall, it's just not the same as putting on the headset. And what we have found based on our survey and, 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 and research into the industry is that by far and away, the most valuable thing you can do to increase awareness about your arcade, about VR, 
is not radio ads, it's not TV ads, it's not social media, even those things, those things do have some effect. It's, it's actually going out into the community and putting on the headset in the, to as many people as you can. And, and kind of the four, four ones that we wanna bring up here, and I'm sure there's more, is schools. Contact your local schools, K-12 schools, middle schools, high schools, whatever it might be, and just go set up a VR station or two. Um, you know, I'm sure you have community or local events, after school programs, churches, uh, all these things, all these places are really, really good to just go set up a VR station and get people to try and bring a discount coupon. So if you haven't opened yet, you know, bring bring coupons that says, hey, you know, bring this to you know during the first month of our open and and get 50% off your first experience or whatever it may be. Like there's just certain things that that you can do. And, and we, like I said, what we found is the most powerful thing you can do is just get the headset onto as many people as you can. Um, cause because like I said, you can you can try to explain to what to people what VR is in a radio ad or a TV ad, but until they put on that headset, um, it just won't click. And, and with the fact that still 95% of people have never tried VR, um, by far and away, you just need to try to get out in the community and get get the headset on. Um, so just a few statistics here. Um, you know, like I mentioned, most of the profitable arcades are definitely spending. Uh, a good chunk of time with these first time users, truly making sure they're fully comfortable with their experience. And then after the kind of the second most powerful thing beyond um, uh, actually getting out into the community and putting on a headset is actually social media. That's been ranked the highest as far as like kind of paid advertising opportunities. Um, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever that might be. And those things are honestly very easy and, and, you know, if you want to do Facebook ads and pay for those, it's actually kind of fairly inexpensive and you can target those and those sorts of things. Or really for, for small business owners, for, you know, if it's just a, you and another co-founder or something like that, they're, they're very manageable, easy things to kind of set up. Just another statistic here is, um, you know, there's been a big debate on, you know, should we offer snacks or, or, or drinks in the arcade? And, you know, it's not super concrete data, but it sure, certainly is interesting to share that 61% of profitable arcades do offer some sort of food and beverage. Now, that doesn't mean that they're offering burgers and fries, but maybe they're offering a Kit Kat and a Reese's or, you know, and a Coke you know, or a Red Bulls, stuff like that. It's something very easy to manage and, and sell. And, and of those 61% that do, and these are, these are just the profitable guys, um, they're saying they, they consider it very important to their overall success. And then another question is, well, should we offer alcohol? And um, that's still kind of remaining to be seen. I think any of you know about Two Bit Circus that's opening up here pretty soon in LA. I think they'll be a really good test case for that. We'll we'll have a little bit more information to share once they do launch. Uh, but anyway, only 20% of the profitable guys do offer alcohol. Now that doesn't mean it's it's not a good idea to do it. We just don't really have the data right now um, to say one way or the other. Okay, so kind of going back to the price points, when I mentioned, you know, the the content side of things, and we think six 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 cents should be the price point um, for content. The the reason why, you know, two years ago, the vast majority of VR arcades were charging upwards of sixty dollars an hour. Uh, to to do VR and and what was quickly found is is what's you, what you're communicating to the community with a price point like that is this is sort of a one time experience you know like skydiving almost it's, it's super expensive you do it once and then you're done uh, and there's really it's it's really hard for a customer to justify coming back on a weekly or even bi weekly basis or even a monthly basis at, at that sort of price point and Overall, we've we've definitely seen dramatic uh, price shifts uh, to to really get the repeat customer up, and that's really what it's all about. It's repeat customers, uh, because if you can get that headset on someone new and they do have that magical first experience, then they're then they're very likely to come back if the price point uh, works for them, right? So we're seeing. Uh, the the majority of profitable arcades actually charging somewhere around twenty five dollars per hour for their customers, um, and some are even charging less than that. And this really allows 
it, it's just much easier for, for your customers to say, you know what, I'm going to come back to this every week or every other week. Um, because when, when you get to the price point of $60 an hour, it's just, I don't know, something in, in the mind that says that that's kind of more of a one time and one and done kind of an experience. You know, I just actually talked to um, our our ninth most or our ninth most popular VR arcade as far as total minutes played. And this is astounding to me. I want to share it with you all. Um, the I would say the majority of the arcades in our top 10 as far as most minutes played have minimum eight stations and if not 10 12 or even 20 or 30. this arcade was ninth most out of our 350 arcades on minutes played and get this they only had five stations now this is just mind-blowing to me that an arcade with only five stations could be ninth most in minutes played it um, as far as our customer base and you know, so the question is, well, how the heck are they doing that? And and the reason is, and now I do not have any data to tell you this financially makes sense or it works, but what I can tell you is they are booked solid um, every day of the week, Monday through Sunday, and, and they're charging $10 an hour on the weekday and $15 an hour on the weekend. And again, I don't have any data to tell you, you know what, this, this works and they're profitable, However, you have to draw the conclusion that lowering your prices absolutely increases the chance that you're going to have repeat customer. No one, no customer, I'll say this, very, very few customers are coming into an arcade and saying, you know what, that was a terrible experience. This technology sucks. I never want to do this again. They're, they always leave the arcade saying this was an amazing experience. I want to do this again. Does it make sense financially? Is it worth it for me to continue to come back over and over and over again? And we have seen that the lower your prices are, the much, much higher chance you are going to have of, of a repeat customer. And I won't get into kind of the, the specifics, you know, some price points just don't make sense in certain regions of the country and, and all of that. But overall, the point being, um, the lower prices seem to be the, the best bet. And uh, I, I will say this too, of, if you are thinking about opening up a VR arcade, uh, what we have found is a minimum number of stations that you should consider opening with is eight. And this is because, you know, uh, outside of, of the arcade that I just talked to you about that only had five stations, the vast majority of your business is actually going to come on the weekends. Uh, so you should honestly, when you're doing your projections and those sorts of things, you you, you should conservatively say that about 75% or maybe even more of your business is going to come on the weekends. It's because, you know, people are in school or at work during the weekdays. And it's just, and what people are finding is they generally get booked solid on the weekends, but having have a real hard time getting people in on the weekdays, right? And so during your weekend busy times, you want to make sure you have as many stations available so you are not in a situation where you're having to turn customers away. And so that's why having more stations, um, at least a minimum of eight is better so that you can have, you know, a proper full house on the weekend. Okay, um, I think last slide here on sales and marketing, I'll move on. Um, just some quick other statistics here. Uh, there's been some some conversation. Well, should we offer a premium booth? Like a premium booth being, they get access to these five special pieces of content if they purchase if they spend a little bit more money for this booth, right? Well, actually, 92% of profitable arcades are not offering this. Um, also, 81% of profitable arcades are also not offering a membership program. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do it or there's no value there, but just just kind of giving you the data as it is today. Um, and then uh, group events are also super, super important. So birthday parties or church events or whatever it may be, uh, advertising those sorts of things on your social media page or whatnot, um, that's that's going to be important because you want to get those birthday parties in and you want to get large groups of kids or folks in to at your arcade. Okay, transitioning to, to content. Um, just going to highlight Beat Saber here for, for this week. Uh, just kind of want to go over three quick things on on first, why is Beat Saber popular? Um, and 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 why is something like a Skyrim VR, like I mentioned, not necessarily the best option for your VR arcade? And uh, it's really the reason is quite simple. Um, 
we've already kind of harped on the fact that 95% of people coming into your arcade have never tried VR, right? So trying to get them into an experience like Skyrim, I'm just using that as an example. There's plenty of other examples where, or where there's lots of menus, there's lots of choices and options, and and you, and there's lots of, you know, the, all the buttons on the controller have multiple functionalities. That stuff can just majorly bog down your employees where they're having to t like really, really babysit those customers. You want to pick content that has little to no menus. You just load the game and there's like a start button or, you know, there's maybe one option like a level select and then a start button. The less menus, the better. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of arcade owners that can kind of confirm that claim that you've got to pick content that does not require you to babysit your customers as, as much as you can. And, and thankfully, there's starting to be content creators that are building content specifically for VR arcades. So we're starting to see more of that, um, which is a good sign. So again, I'll send out this, this handout at the end of, of the webinar where you can kind of click these links uh, to uh, the Beat Saber tournament. So right now, we actually have 130 participating um, in this tournament, it's a global tournament. Uh, it actually starts on the 17th, which is Friday. Uh, so there's still an opportunity to to join and, and be a part of it. We'd love, if, if you are operating a VR arcade, um, we'd love for you to join. And like I said, we'll have links there for you when I give you the handout at the end. So you can get all, all the rules and, and stuff like that um, there. Okay, um, so last thing before we go into AMA with um, with Spencer is just a quick feature spotlight of uh, of our advertising opportunity in, in Springboard VR. So in our launcher environment, we give you the ability to kind of customize different ads or announcements that you wanna have in your arcade. And so here's just some examples of what you could do uh, this we we kind of borrowed these from our good friend James out in Alaska, who operates the arcade Arctic Sun Virtual Reality. And here are some of the ads that he has for his arcade. I'll kind of show you um, what they look like here on this next slide. So this is our launcher environment. This is obviously a, a 2D mockup of of the 3D environment. Uh, so this is when your customer puts on the headset. This is what they see. And here's some really creative things that you can do with these advertisements. So hey, you know just letting people know different things, you know, instead of you having to communicate them, they're, they're seeing it with their eyes, different opportunities or promotions that you may have at your arcade. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll kind of go back again. Here's different options. Obviously there's, you can do anything you want to do. Um, you can have the full or the half size um, as, as, as seen here in this image, here's the two halves and here's a full, but you can communicate whatever you want to to your customers while they're while they are immersed in the VR headset. So, and you can change these whenever you want to. So, hey, this weekend we're having a special tournament or a special whatever. And anyway, there's lots of customizations that you can have with our um, advertising feature in the launcher there. Okay, um, I think that is it. Um, let me see if I can find. Spencer here and pull him in so that he has a microphone uh, and make you an admin. And again, uh, I think the Q and A's are piling up, which is great. Love to see that. Uh, go ahead and get over to the Q and A tab, ask any question you want. You can direct it directly towards Spencer um, as an arcade owner question or to Springboard, any platform or Beat Saber tournament questions, anything like that, feel free to ask away. Um, I'm going to, Spencer, you should have access now to turn on your microphone. And, uh, but basically, Spencer, like I mentioned at the beginning, he, um, he's been operating VE in Provo for about a year and a half now and um, has had a lot of success doing it. He's actually, you know, we mentioned you know, getting out into the community and just giving people free VR experiences. Uh, from what I remember, Spencer, when he first opened his arcade, I, something like the first month of his operations, he operated free just to get people in the headset to experience what it was like. And I think he had a lot of success doing that. Um, 
And so anyway, Spencer, uh, do you, are you with us? Yeah, is my mic working? Yes. Perfect. Uh, man, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I, I'm going to just kind of uh, ask you maybe two or three questions here just to kind of get you going and then and then we'll turn it over to our, our q a and, and let the community ask you anything and um but yeah um so yeah i mean just quickly why don't you kind of just give us an overview of you know who you are your arcade how'd you get into it how has it been uh overall just kind of your experience yeah for sure um like you said i started about a year and a half ago um, I actually started because I was looking for something to do with my brother. Um, he's a big gamer um, and definitely the the techie guy out of the two of us. Um, and so we started it in Provo because it was a big college town. Um, so we assumed that that would be a good place to start it. And like you said, uh, from the beginning, our strategy was get the headset on as many people as possible um, at whatever cost that is. Um, and I'll expand on that a little bit later because we learned a lot of things about getting people in for free and what works best. Um, but yeah, I mean, things are going good. Uh, the arcade is profitable. We broke even about three months into it. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah. No, it's great, man. So kind of tell us expectations going in versus those first couple of months. like. Did you make any major changes those first uh, one or two months to, to be able to get to the break even point in three months? Or was it just kind of awareness in the community or what, what sort of changes, if any, did you make during those or, or, or rather maybe what are some of the big things that you learned those kind of first three months or so? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we definitely made a lot of changes. We made a lot of changes in the first six months as uh, the big reason why is just because it was a new industry and we didn't know uh, any of the industry rules or whatever. We were just trying to figure out what worked best. Um, one of the biggest changes we made is we originally allowed four per booth and we set it up more like a top golf experience. Um, and we changed it more into, um, well, we changed the rule to two per booth and, and changed it to more of a multiplayer laser tag experience. Um, well, not really laser tag, but just really put, that's what we, that's how we switched our advertising was, you know, come in with your friends and all play in this game together instead of come and huddle around, uh, one person, uh, and watch if that makes sense. Um, a big reason for that is because we realize that return customers are key and that people, uh, are only going to come and watch friends do the plank so many times. Um, and yep. that you needed to get them on games where uh, it was competitive and um, where they were actually uh, more into the VR than into their friends' reactions. Right. So, so for you, was there was there some aha moment as far as the multiplayer content aspect of it, or can you speak just a little bit on like the importance of multiplayer? Yeah, I mean. If there was an aha moment, it was actually probably uh, at IAPA um, going and doing zero latency. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, so IAPA is just a big um, entertainment conference. Um, I don't know, probably the biggest in America. I, I don't really know, but um, but they uh, they had a lot of uh, VR. I went to just get some ideas and uh, zero latency. If people don't know, they're just a room scale, uh, not not room scale, but um, like warehouse uh, free roam VR setup. And so we went and tried out their um, their deal. And uh, one of the things that I had, I didn't really realize was just kind of the hype around uh, watching, you know, the instructional video, getting your gear on, talking about it with all your friends, and then going in at the exact same time. And um, I realized that we were kind of missing that moment, um, especially with advertising. Uh, and so that's when I made a big shift on our website and on our marketing to specifically multiplayer. We already changed the rule um, to two people per booth, but that's when I really realized that that's how you got to market the product. Nice. That's awesome. Um, well, I'll ask you maybe one more question here and then 
if you want to share anything else specific, feel free to. Otherwise, we'll kind of just jump into the AMA. But I wanted to ask you, you know, the importance you, you mentioned repeat customers and, and the importance. But can you just kind of expound on that and, and how do you grow kind of a repeat customer client base? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so one of the big things which I was I kind of tuned in uh, right before you you brought me on. Uh, and you'd already mentioned it, but the price point has to be low. Um, the arcade that uh, we are competing with when we first came on, they had been in, already in the town before us. Uh, they were charging that dollar per minute, and we realized right away that that wasn't going to work long term. So you got to keep your price point low. Um, and we actually do uh, one of our deals are, are uh, a buy one, get one free on Tuesday. And we fill that up every single Tuesday. Um, just because people that are returning want that lower price point. Um, but uh, as far as getting people in and getting returns, um, you got to get the headset on people so people experience it first off. And so we, um, like you had mentioned, we had done free for a long time, or like right out the bat, we did like a few weeks of just come in and play for free. Um, we realized that there's a lot of problems with that, uh, mostly that there's a group of people that are just looking for a free ride um, with anything. And so you don't really get the right customers. You want to get people who are willing to pay um, every single time they come and are willing to pay full price. And so we realize the best way to get people inside the headset is to, is to create, it's still free, but in a way that they don't realize they're getting it for free. Um, and how we do that is we go to, uh, we're in Utah, and so there's a lot of LDS groups. So we'd go to LDS youth groups and and offer their, you know, the people who are in charge of the groups, uh, the free entrance. But the kids who are coming in didn't really realize it's for free. They didn't, you know, it wasn't like they were chasing a free ticket. They just were coming. And so um, in that way, we weren't getting people that are just looking for a cheap uh, price, but people were able to get in for free, experience it, um, and then they were willing to pay full price. But the way that we re retain them is, uh, so we do an online waiver um, with every person that comes in, and then we just automatically check that they're willing to receive, you know, advertisements or whatever. And most people just leave it, and so we collect all email addresses, and we have uh, an email campaign that goes out, you know, three or four times a week uh, with deals and reminders. And the biggest thing is you just got to remind people to come in. Um, and I feel like once you get them, you know, a couple times, they tend to come in, a, uh, you know, after that. So oh, that's great. Um, very much appreciate that. I mean, we covered a few different topics here. Um, is there anything that you want to talk on specifically before we turn it over to the community to ask you anything? Um. No, no, I mean, I, I, I'm willing to take some questions, but let's just do that. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm, I'm over here at the, the Q&A piece of this thing, and there, uh, there's usually a way to filter this by the most upvoted questions, but for some reason it's being weird. Um, so I'll just kind of, kind of go through this as is. Does everyone have the ability to – upvote these questions or anyway, uh, I don't know what's going on there, but you, there should be a way to upvote the questions. Maybe big markers having some issues. I'm not too sure. Um, hmm. Okay. So I will just kind of start from the top here. How do you deal with hygiene? Um, so we have like wipes on each station um, and then we have a, um, a towel on each station. And so the customers have the ability to wipe it themselves. We, I have, um, the employees also wipe it down after each session. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, uh, with our arcade is we have an instructional video that, uh, explains how to put on the headset, how to work springboard, how to take off the headset, everything like that. And so our employees never actually touch the headset or put it on the customers um, until it's time to wipe it down, um, which I strongly recommend 
just because of the fact that you do got to keep them clean. And so you, it's hard if your employees have to clean it, put it on, take it off. Um, it, it, there's not enough time to do it. Right. Okay. Next question. Um, and, and I'll say <laughs> these questions are, are, hundred percent up to Spencer to answer however he wants to answer. Um, but, and, and if you want to just pass Spencer, just tell me pass and there's no worries there at all. But, um, what, what is your current monthly per headset sales per month? Um, I don't have the per headset number on me. I know it dramatically increases from one to 10. So I have 10 stations. And so, you know, um, and I fill it up from one to 10. And so, you know, certain headsets make more than others. Right. right. Um, but, uh, uh, just a general idea. I mean, obviously it, it changes quite a bit from month to month as well. Um, but with, uh, 10 headsets, uh, you can, I, I've found that I, my, the peak that I can gross is, uh, 20,000. Um, and from what I've, from talking to other arcades and stuff, um, it, it pretty much just, you know, you can just double that if if you get more headsets, which is one reason why I'd really recommend doing at least 16. If I was starting up all over again, I, I wouldn't do any less than 16. So then uh, let me just expand on that. Like the 16 number is that, you know, I talked about the importance of weekend, uh, the weekends. Is that kind of the reasoning behind going for 16 or? or yeah, is, definitely. Definitely. Is there a scientific number to the 16 or could it be 14 or just curious? Yeah, no. Um, so there's a couple reasons, uh, why, well, well one for the weekends, I, I've got about 14 to 15 hours a week that I fill every single time, no matter what. And so when I look at the numbers, I always incorporate that I'm going to be hundred percent within those hours. And then how much do I need to make, um, for it to be worth it? But anyway, uh, as far as the 16 number exactly, um, from the people that I've talked to, they feel comfortable around um, one employee for every eight headsets, which I think is um, I, I agree with. And so I like the number 16 because it makes uh, hiring employees easy and just like managing like how many you have on staff at a time. No, that's great. Um, okay, next question. Uh, can you talk about from when you very first started to now, uh, just a customer uptick is, are you are you seeing your arcade consistently bringing in more customers or more repeat customers or has it started to to, to peak? Um, the specific question is, after a year and a half, are you seeing increase in customers or a drop off? Yeah, so I, I've definitely seen an increase. At one year, um, we, we brought, we bring in, we brought in like every week more and more new customers. Um, and the way I can see that is I only have someone uh, sign the waiver if they're new. Um, that number's kind of leveled off. I consistently have about 150 new customers a week. Um, but I've seen, what I've seen with return customers though, is there's, you have a customer that starts to return like, once every two weeks, you have a customer that starts to return once a month. But the thing that you see the most often is you see a customer come back like once a quarter or they come two times a year. And so, you know, as you, the longer you're in business, the more you have of those people coming in, um, which is what's really tipped the scales for us where we really started to make a good profit was once we started having enough of those people coming back. That's awesome. Um, next question. I know the answer to this is no, he does not offer zero latency, but I, I'll kind of ask it in a different way, Spencer. Um, what do you think the future of VR arcades are and, and how, how long do you think your offering of just room scale booths will last? And are you considering, uh, potentially adding some sort of room scale or, uh, offering in the future? Um, so to start out, I mean, I wouldn't have ever done it if I didn't think that the like regular room scale VR would be a long-term thing. Um, I think that uh, costs, like you can keep your costs lower. Um, and I think content is the most important 
part of the of the customer experience and so having a way for content to be made uh like streamlined like so like there's multiple people that can make it for one device is really important and so you know moving to warehouse would limit that so i think that um there's i you know i mean it's impossible to say when it when if ever things will only be like warehouse or or whatever the term is um as far as if i'll ever switch um it would just 100 percent depend on um the circumstances if if i'm really profitable and i've seen the profits drop off um because people are starting to do the void or zero latency or whatever and i and i feel like the effort's worth it to make the switch i guess very good uh what was your number one advertising game asks paul riddle um, I've done a lot of, I mean, I've tried a lot of different advertising. Uh, the two things that have worked best are AdWords and Facebook, well, AdWords and social media. Um, and the reason for that is uh, that I can measure it precisely. Um, we start turning customers away pretty quickly um, once we would reach our, um, like our peak capacity. And so I hate to spend extra money on advertising. So uh, that way I can, you know, uh, tune into exactly what I'm spending to get my customer. Um, and then uh, the only other advertising I do still at times is, is the free. I, I'll bring in free groups on, on slow days to get more people inside the headset. Now the cheapest advertising is actually the email campaigns. So that's that's another one that I didn't mention. Nice, nice. And how do you how do you start to increase your kind of email list? How do you get people on that list and to begin with? Uh, mentioning it to people, everyone that comes through, I my, I've and trained my employees to follow us on so to mention to follow us on social media and uh, to join our email campaign. Uh, but then everyone that signs a waiver, um, I have the check mark box automatically marked to enter into our um, our campaign uh, and so I collect emails there great um, I'm gonna ask a question from Bossit. I apologize that's not totally how you pronounce your name but uh, do you do you recommend installing HTC Vive pros compared to the HTC Vive do you curious Spencer do you have any experience or do you know yeah I mean I'll, I'll give you the little experience I have and my personal opinion I mean it obviously it only holds so much clout, you know, I don't know what other people's opinions are, but uh, personally, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to switch over to um, the pro um, because right now, so I, I, I project like, um, well, I spend about 3% gross on like replacing parts. Um, and it's gotten better the longer we've been in business because the uh, the Vive headset's gotten cheaper. Um, for instance, if you look at it, if you break everything out, if you buy the Vive in a box um, between the two paddles and the cord and the headset, you're really only spending about $200 for your headset. Um, and so you can replace a headset for a reasonably low price where uh, you can't with the Pro. Um, and then, so as far as like, and then, um, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's got to be really high of people that have actually tried the Vive and will really know the difference or even care about the difference. And so cost is everything. Um, as far as if I would switch, the only time that I would eventually switch is if the experience with the wireless is just as good and the price gets low enough that uh, um, it's cheaper to have the wireless because of the cost to replace cords. Replacing cords is the uh, is the biggest part of the cost for hardware. Um, and so if wireless eliminates that, um, then I'd be willing to spend more for the headset, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's good. Um, we're gonna ask maybe two or three more questions here and then wrap it up. Uh, so please, go into the Q&A, upvote which question you want us to ask. We unfortunately won't be able to get to all of these questions in here. 
Um, so use that upvote feature in there and, and uh, upvote the question that you want uh, Spencer to answer. So um, next question from Tyler is, where'd it go? Uh, ballpark, what was your total startup cost? Um, so our startup cost uh, before like extra working capital and advertising costs was about a hundred grand. Um, it'd be a lot cheaper now just because the HTC Vive has gotten cheaper um, and I would be more efficient if I was gonna do another next location. Um, but if I was gonna budget it out for next location for, for a 16 station breakout, I would budget $100,000 for the, for the startup costs and then about $50,000 for uh, working capital while you're waiting to break even and advertising costs. Cool. Um, I don't know if the upvote feature isn't working or, or what's going on, but, um, hmm. uh, how, how about I ask this question? This is from Amy Allison. What support from developers and, and game publishers would you want to help drive cool promotions at your arcade tournaments, free swag? Could, could you say that question one more time? Yeah. So I think Amy, 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 I think is a game developer or a publisher and she's asking, uh, what would you want to help drive maybe business to your arcade from, from the game developers tournaments or, or free swag or anything maybe in general that the game developers can do to, to help business for you all? Well, um, a couple things. I mean, the biggest thing is just, we have to have a price that that works, um, which I know springboards working really hard on. Um, and, so that would be the biggest thing. Um, an idea that I've talked about with a couple developers is uh, utilizing the money that we give you um, monthly at times to use for advertising campaigns for tournaments for your specific game so that we're advertising your game in our local area. Um, I don't know if developers would be interested in that just because I know that they're so busy and it'd be hard to communicate with individual arcades. Um, but that's something that I thought would be helpful um, if uh, yeah yeah that's all I got for that question that's good uh, next question from Stephen Pryor I guess I'm just gonna kind of go and just pick pick out maybe a couple more here that I think might be good for the yeah, no product. what's the average age of, of your customers uh, younger limit any data on that type of thing yeah for sure so our median or like our average age is 23 years old and um, it just falls off right from there. Now, I think a big reason for that is because we are in a college town with a lot of college students. Um, I don't know if that shifts. Um, I've heard, uh, I've talked to VRCade in Canada quite a bit. They said theirs is 28. Um, mine's 23, and then there is an uptick. So it falls off um, slowly. I mean, it, it, it's not like it's dramatic that 20. it's like 23, and then you know there's no 20 year olds. It, it's, it's a pretty slow decline if you're like looking at like, if you're looking at it on a chart. Um, but there is an uptick around like uh, 13 years old. So we have like a lot of preteens, and then, um, uh, but the the average, the like the most common age is 23. Very good, very good. Okay, maybe one or two more questions here. Um, let's see, let's see. Vive or Oculus? I I know he's gonna say Vive. Do you want to expound on that at all, Spencer? Yeah, I mean, I think it just goes back to what I was saying with um, the warehouse where you know you just want things that are streamlined and vive is the the you know most used headset and so you just have you know the software works better for it the arcades you, you just have everyone using it so it, it just it's easier and then room skip i mean I, I just personally think it's a better headset as well but yeah uh this question from george casillas this might be our last one here um do most of your sales come from group events or individuals on weekends? And maybe you can just talk a little bit about group events as well, if you want. Yeah, I mean, group events are definitely definitely vital. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know the breakout between um, group events and single events. I can say, though, that so we charge $25 an hour, and um, our average sale is over $50. So most people are coming in and buying um, more than one station. It's not like single people coming in. Um, it just, 
off the top, like just like if I was eyeballing it, I would definitely say that um, just people coming in in like groups of three, four, five, and six are are where we're getting most of our money. You know, we're not we're not doing like five or six corporate events a week. So the the biggest, I mean, families and groups of friends are where we're getting most of our money. Great. Okay, well, um, I want to thank you, Spencer. Let's everybody give Spencer a big thanks for taking time out of his day to, to do this with us. Uh, if you still do have questions, uh, Springboard, you can definitely send us an email at Springboard, support at springboardvr.com or go to our contact form on our website. Uh, we're here to help you succeed. Uh, so, I mean, if you have these questions, if you're thinking about opening an arcade, we have tons of resources. If you're a family entertainment center and you're looking for more of a turnkey solution to, to get going, we've got partners that we can, um, we'd love to introduce you to. Or if you're in Provo, Utah, and you wanna go uh, shake Spencer's hands and, and maybe buy him a beer or lunch and ask him questions, I'm sure uh, he, he'd be happy to do that. So again, Spencer, thank you so much. And uh, community, thank you all for, for coming. Uh, Please feel free if, if, if you really wanted your question answered and didn't get answered, again, please email us, send us a contact form. We'd, we'd be happy to help you out in, in any way we can. We want you guys to be successful. We're glad you joined us and um, we will talk to you all next time. Hey, thanks, Jordan. Yeah, thank you, Spencer. See ya.